Thanks, Nick, and thanks to everybody um, listening today, and thank you to Brand Innovators for having us today. We definitely wanted to try something new, um, and so we'll give it a whirl today, see how it goes. We'll look forward to your feedback. Um, Seth and I are going to tag team this in a form of a little bit of a case study format. I know everybody's very familiar, at least everybody I know, a lot of the uh, folks, especially on the brand side, who have gone through this call it modified season and modified year of 2020, as I know many of the speakers have spoke to, um, but certainly the NBA season, which just recently wrapped and is about to kick off, tip off again, um, has been one that is for the storybooks. Um, thought it was a little, I thought it'd be a little bit interesting um, for you to hear, call it a little bit of that behind the scenes storylines. Um, and again, to Nick's point, um, and then bring it to you from call it like uh, the broadcaster and the brand side, um, kind of all together. Um, just a quick introduction on myself. I'm Shiz. I, I head up sponsorships at AT&T. Um, and, and Seth, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Seth Cole and I uh, lead our brand partnerships and our integrated marketing team at Turner Sports and a corporate cousin to So much. <laughs> um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar, Turner Sports is a part of Warner Media, which is a part of AT&T. And so um, as a modern media company, that's kind of the connective tissue there in case you were wondering why. Um, the two of us were, were holding hands through here on, on today's presentation. So anyways, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. I'll uh, put together a few pretty slides, but just meant to be kind of a, to help guide us our, in our storytelling today. Um, you know, for us, um, Seth's got a lot longer of a story to storyline here, but for us at AT&T, we, we tipped off um, our relationship with the NBA, and I think as most of you are familiar, it's not just the NBA, it's also the WNBA, which we're very passionate about. Of course, the G League, USA Basketball, NBA 2K League, with our passion in esports and other emerging um, areas, call it of technology and sports. Um, and we tipped off this relationship during, call it the 18 and 19 season, um, but in all honesty, it was really February 19, uh, 19 which was last year, it's kind of hard to imagine. Um, you know, like, like most of these deals um, tend to go, because, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard to plan these the perfect way. It was nine days before All-Star, NBA All-Star in Charlotte. And, um, you know, we, we, we had an immense and incredible amount of things that we had to pull off from an activation standpoint, from a brand standpoint, from experiential, et cetera. And so it was kind of this mad dash, if you will, um, you know, for, for us. Um, at the company, you know, and, and, and the things that we love to do, um, certainly through the partnerships that, that we have, NBA being one of them, is around telling really authentic stories about your products and services, right? And so, um, you know, in, in this case, uh, you know, our priority right now is around 5G. I don't think that's any, a surprise to anybody. Um, and so, for us, you know, we've been hyper-focused on, on partnering in with, you um, uh, our partners, broadcasters, et cetera, um, we truly believe in this um, philosophy or ethos around a, a collaborative approach to development. Um, you know, I know I say this to a lot of my partners, so if any of my partners are on, on they'd probably be laughing, but, you know, this, uh, it, that collaborative approach is really important because I always tell our partners, like, listen, at the end of the day, y'all know your fans the best. Um, we know our products and services the best, what our brand represents the best, and certainly when you start to bring and merge those things together, that is when you um, are able to create, call it that perfect um, representation of that cuts across all. And so, you know, for us, we've done, call it a lot of first and 5G, and, you know, um, I'm really proud and excited about the fact that, you know, we obviously market 5G, so you see a lot of messaging and signage and all, all types of media integrations, but it's a really important place for us to, to showcase 5G and technology and other products and services in a really authentic way that resonates with fans and audiences. So, um, even last year, um, it was so early on, the Summer League um, 2019, 
um, and that was in partnership with ESPN um, out in Las Vegas, um, seems like an eternity ago. Um, and we did the first ever 5G broadcast um, for live sports event there, and that was all in partnership with um, Steve Helmuth and the, and the technology team over at the NBA. Um, obviously, a lot of our 5G internal organizations as well. Um, and then quickly followed that up with tip off of this past season that fall. Um, and so Seth and Turner and, and all of our, our friends um, and we worked together to create a 3D um, hologram of Candace Parker. And so she came in via 5G in order to, um, you know, be a part of the analyst desk for the, the tip off broadcast, which is also a really exciting feat. Um, and then we also over at AT&T, and I'm going to divert from NBA for just two seconds, but AT&T Stadium, certainly home of the Dallas Cowboys, a naming rights property we're super proud of. Um, we've done quite a bit there, um, including being the first um, sporting um, uh, venue for the United States that has 5G in it. Um, we then, um, you know, installed it with a whole bunch of 5G experiences, including Pose with the Pros, which has won many awards, and it's been so humbling to see how, how people have been so excited about that. Um, you know, I think it's had like 500 million plus impressions, et cetera. I know we get calls from all around the world, our business sales team does. And then, of course, the All Star NBA All Star Game earlier this year in February out of Chicago United Center. We're a proud sponsor of the Chicago Bulls, um, and we were able to uh, have this really exciting partnership again with Turner in bringing um, Shaquille O'Neal to the court side with a 5G camera in hand and get some really unique camera angles only. Check can um, and bring that to you in broadcast as well as um, for those folks that were on site. And so, you know, this is just these are just examples, right? Of things that we love to do with our products and services in a way to to tell these authentic stories to better resonate and deepen those connections with our customer base. But, anyways, um, I'll, let me pass it over to Seth, who who's going to tell us a little bit more about the the depth of the Turner Sports relationship with the league. Perfect. Thank you. You know, I, I, we, we have a little longer in the game for the NBA than AT&T, but uh, on December 22nd, we're uh, excited to start our 37th season of coverage within Turner, Pro, uh, Turner Properties. So that's exciting. So we have TNT as kind of our marquee games of the week. And then we also jointly operate uh, NBA.com, NBA TV, and NBA Social with the NBA uh, with our content studios in Atlanta. And then we also operate Bleacher Report and House of Highlights. So all of them are deeply embedded in covering NBA and the culture around it. So we've been excited for that. Uh, we could not be any more excited to have games again in a few weeks. Uh, and we also have long been partners with AT&T well before uh, the acquisition, but also in other properties like NCAA that we have for the men's division one uh, tournament, hopefully coming back here in March. Uh, we also have Major League Baseball uh, we have the match for some golf events. We also have E-League, which is our uh, gaming platform, uh, and that's it. So we're pretty excited. Yeah, and I thought I'd also share a little, little bit kind of behind the curtain. Um, I get asked a lot, and Seth, I don't know if you do as well, but um, you know, a lot of people ask, well, listen, AT&T is a ginormous company. And certainly, um, the, you know, with the acquisition of Time Warner and now Warner Media, you know, how do you do it? Like, how do you do this integration? Um, and uh, I, I think this is just, again, part of the case study and an interesting, um, call it process, if you will, and, and, and maybe will hopefully give somebody out there, whether you're in a smaller company or a larger company, um, some insights into maybe some things that have worked really well for us. Um, we actually host something called uh, the Center of Excellence or Project Management Office, COE or PMO, whatever acronym you want to put on it because we're in the telecom industry. Um, but um, really, it's, it's, it's meant to be around how do you do purposeful and intentional integration? And especially when you have people that are dispersed all across the country, which is even more relevant today, right? Especially with everybody working from home, um, across many t different time zones, across many different business units, um, with different, you know, goals and things that are, of course, representative of each of those groups. And, you know, we've got a, a, a pretty robust process in place. And what you really need is, is, a, is a group that kind of 
just at that center, right? Imagine it a little bit like a hub and spoke meal, uh, hub and spoke model. And, um, you know, and it's really important to have call it like the right set of people at the center. Um, Cause there's so many times that you create these types of processes and what ends up happening is it becomes like a readout process, right? And nobody wants that. Nobody intends it to be that way, right? But it is really about the things that, that I've seen that has really worked and, and has progressed um, the progress of innovation and collaboration is around things like, uh, you know, it, it is about motivation. It is about being able to, uh, you know, motivate others within the call or within other groups to come to the table and, and share and to help ideate. Um, it's to, you know, to help, um, you know, elevate other groups, find commonalities, um, tying the different threads together, right? There's usually golden threads that you can pull out of all the different business units in order to find what are those key pieces that are really going to help elevate the overall company and the brand? And so, you know, ultimately, I think it is really about intentional or purposeful collaboration, um, especially now when we're all at home. You don't have those moments of running into each other in the elevator or in an office somewhere or what have you. And so, uh, you know, for, for us, it has been really about um, creating those opportunities in a very intentional way. So I, I thought I'd share that because I, I know I do. I get um, asked that all the time. Um, so we're going to go to a date that um, changed it all. I think for a lot of the folks on this call, we'll, we'll clearly remember March 11th to be that date um, because that was the day that um, uh, Adam Silver uh, put a pause to the NBA season with COVID. Um, and so it's always a bit of a flashback when you kind of revert back and put, try to put yourself in, in your own shoes of, of what was going on um, around that time. Um, for me, I had just come out of a pre-pro for a, a pretty high-profile athlete. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of the NBA season. We are, we were, you know, we're in the middle of March Madness and, and Final Four. You know, of course, that's also with Turner and Seth, Tribeca Film Festival, the Masters were coming up, uh, ESL One and esports tournaments, what have you. And obviously, everything, that domino effect of the NBA season being paused, you know, was that everything else was paused, um, you know, uh, as well. And so, you know, for, for me as the leader of my team, I know there, there was call it a, a sense of loss for sure. Right. And in terms of, you know, something that we are not used to as experiential marketers and, and, and putting on activations plans that you have put together for, uh, you know, six, eight, a year, a year in advance. And having to take those apart is certainly a heartbreaking process to go through. Um, and one that, you know, you have to carefully, you know, navigate and help your team navigate through. Um, and so certainly that that is one that, um, you know, is, is definitely entrenched in my memory. Um, but certainly then, and, and you know, whenever there's working from home, uh, you're, you're trying to homeschool your children um, and so many different other pressures and stress um, you know, factors and just not knowing, right, what's next. Um, but then we did, we, we quickly, it was about let's reset. We paused, we took things down and now we reset. Um, and so it was about new research. What are these new cultural moments that are coming out? How do we, how do we think about pivoting activations for the rest of the year, et cetera? And especially when we don't know when, when things are going to return. So that was kind of my moment around that time. But Seth, what about what was your experience like then? <laughs> uh, from being as busy as ever to not being busy. Uh, yeah, ours started on the night before, so late on the tenth. We got an email from Warner Media saying, "For the foreseeable future, we'll be working remotely." So not really knowing what that meant. I was sitting there the night after on the eleventh. I remember watching as Rudy Gobert tested positive, and we were waiting on the Jazz to come out of the locker room. And then watching Don Lemon later that night and seeing Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson and all of a sudden things became real. Uh, and, uh, and then all of a sudden Adam's announcement, which I think was the smart move to do, uh, was to be out there first and, and put the season on pause. And then slowly after that, all the dominoes falling of all the, the, the men's division one conference uh, finals being canceled. And then on Thursday that week, uh, Dan Gavitt and the NCAA canceling the March Madness tournament. So, uh, you know, we were on pace to have one of the most historic years we've had at Turner. And the demand we saw from both NBA and NCAA was through the roof. 
uh, and we were really on, 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 on pace to, to do some amazing things with our partners. Uh, so that all changed and then quickly uh, we, we thought to ourselves, you know, we were working on doing another Tiger versus Phil event and uh, we had buy-in from Peyton Manning and Tom Brady to participate. So we were looking at a different date further down the year, but all of a sudden everybody that is usually incredibly difficult to schedule around uh, was wide open. And Tom uh, Brady made the joke that he'll be in Florida and Tiger lives in Florida. Uh, and we quickly went to work to figure out a safe way to kind of break the norms of what we're used to and bring, you know, some additional content to fans at home that have been locked to news programming for, for weeks. So we were able to establish one of the first kind of major sports events uh, during the COVID experience. Uh, so we, we were quickly able to put together that with Tiger uh, and Peyton and Phil and Tom. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. We raised over $20 million um, from donations from sponsors and partners, as well as the viewers at home, uh, as well as at and and Warner Media. So we raised $20 million and it was the most viewed uh, golf event ever in cable history. So it was it was a nice event to work on. We had great buy-in. I saw Nick on there earlier, but Michelob Valtra has been uh, a big partner of it over the last two. Uh, and looking forward to the next one the day after Thanksgiving. So I give a little plug for that if people are at home on Black Friday. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a roller coaster. And I, I wouldn't say it's ended yet, um, but yeah, that day will never be forgotten for me. Yeah, no, and we look forward to the to the next event up in November. I mean, we just go back to back, right? There's no rest for the weary, <laughs> certainly this this season. Um, yeah, selfishly, I was hoping the NBA would give us a little bit of a retreat, <laughs> but uh, with the fan inside, he's happy. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, coming back to the NBA theme story here is around the challenge, right? So the NBA obviously um, announced the resumption of the season in a way that's never been done before, which was in the bubble format um, out at Walt Disney World. And so for us became call it the challenge, right? And so as we think about, well, you know, in this time of COVID, no more in person physical activations. What is the new strategy? How do we think about the plans for the rest of the year? We've got some significant investments here and an opportunity as well for us to go tell some really incredible stories. And so, you know, for us, it was number one, it was about we had to flip the script, right? And, and sometimes out of call it adversity comes the greatest opportunity and some of the greatest um, things that maybe you wouldn't have done otherwise. And so, you know, if there's a silver lining to all of us, it's certainly that. Um, it was relooking at all of our activations in a form of call it, you know, more digital, social, in broadcast integrations. Um, and certainly, you know, it was taking tally of what types of assets do we have access to? What is it that we can do? And starting from that place to ideate. So, you know, being presenter of both the Eastern and um, Western Conference Finals, et cetera. Um, we knew that there were some challenges around um, access to the bubble. I mean, trying to do and pull off something around that's high tech, like with 5G. I mean, that stuff takes months of planning in advance. That takes careful coordination of, you know, installation, having people on site, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, for us, it, 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 it became a, a huge effort and, and a very quick effort, right? Because since they, once the NBA announced the return, there wasn't much time between then and when all the, 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 the gameplay started again. So um, that, was, that was certainly a challenging moment for us. Seth, what was it that you guys experienced when that announcement came out of the return? <laughs> uh, again, the roller coaster of emotion. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing was just all the hypotheticals. You know, as we worked with our partners, uh, you know, we were all in the same boat. We really didn't know what it was going to be like. We, we knew on paper what we were trying to accomplish, um, but it quickly became, you know, yeah, we probably could do that. We can't do that. And then really figuring out how limited we were with kind of access to the players, rightfully so. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I have all the details, but, you know, essentially the green zone is the area around the court and Warner Media as a whole had about seven passes and that includes our talent that called the game. So, you know, they were very protective and, and it worked out. Uh, so we really had to get creative with our partners and how we brought things to life, but still gave them the value and still gave them those experiences to the fans that were a little bit more than just watching the you know, television or on television everywhere. Um, so that was really what we worked into. And I, I think the, the fun thing about it is I think a lot of the partners in at t especially really leaned into how do we make this impactful for the fan. So it wasn't so much about, 
you know, what we're doing in arena or this is really how do we give the fans something that they, they can't get somewhere else uh, and make the viewing experience a little bit more uh, unique. So that was for me the, the biggest thing. And I, I think, uh, you know, weeks and weeks of preparing for it and uh, knock on wood, it all came out like, like planned. Now you said seven people on site. What, I mean, what, how many do you usually normally have like on an ideal scenario? Yeah. In a, in a typical NBA game, I mean, a typical NBA game, you're probably talking 50 to 100, you know, Turner people, not counting, not counting a normal, uh, you know, uh, arena staff. Uh, and then on a big, you know, all-star weekend, you're talking hundreds, you know, uh, that are touching all different facets to the broadcast and our social content. Uh, so it was, it was tough. And then, you know, even areas that we could go into, People would have to go in, set up, you know, what we're about to talk about, but, you know, set up even a camera, uh, would have to do that when the players weren't there, and then someone else would come check it, and then they would allow the next group of folks in. So it was very uh, time consuming, too, to pull things off. And in this case, it was tight collaboration between y'all and ESPN as well, right? Because uh, of the limitations and, yeah. Yeah, I would say for us, you know, it was not Turner and ESPN. It was, you know, we were all one big family. And I think if you watch yeah. the telecast, even the, the broadcasters felt that way. It was not, you know, I don't view us as competitors for the most part. You know, we are covering the same sports and we work together. We're used to that. But I think this one was truly like, how do we bring the game of basketball back in a safe way? Uh, and I think all sides, you know, you know, carried their own to, to, to help out the, the larger cause for sure. Yeah, such certainly a, a relatable story to the panel that was right before us as well. I know as um, the gentleman from Burger King was talking about their collaboration and their, you know, call it, it's about the entire industry, not just about us. Um, certainly it is a relatable storyline. Um, so we obviously had some great collaboration. Um, and to your point, um, you know, I, I certainly, you know, as, from a brand perspective, that type collaboration that, Turner and ESPN had basically as one broadcaster for all intents and purposes, like being all in was something that was incredible for us um, because in these types of cases, right, it's you're trying to pull off something that you've never done before. You're in a, in a, in a campus bubble that you didn't have too much time to prepare for in the middle of a pandemic. We always have to keep saying that. It's like we were, we're also in the middle of a pandemic while we're all trying to make this happen. Um, obviously the NBA in their priority first and foremost was about the safety and security about of the players and, and the athletes and, and all of the staff that, that is there. Um, and then, you know, for us, we had to figure out some really quick plans. It was about what does the technology start to shape up, look like, how does that get set up, where. Um, a lot of times we had to do some site visits remotely, which was, it's almost inconceivable, right, prior to COVID, but you know what, you make it work. Um, and then there was obviously quarantining of some, a few key people. And so, Seth, kind of to your point, you know, you had seven people versus, the, you know, potentially 100 plus people that you normally have in an ideal scenario. Same for us. We had a very limited number of people that were on site, which, you know, normally, right, we would we would probably have triple that amount of people because you've got, you know, duplication. You've got, call it like a parallel path, duplication of efforts. That way, if something happens, you've got the backup option ready to go, et cetera. But in the time of COVID, you don't have that type of optionality. Um, and so for us, we ended up turning um, one of the hotel ballrooms into this interview studio. And uh, this interview studio uh, was powered by uh, one of our 5G kits that we brought in. Um, and this is to power um, the, pro the product, if you will, that we have now called the AT&T 5G Holovision, which kind of alludes to here, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, but the power here is really about um, having a studio there on site for the athlete. There was another studio that would be set up over um, either with ESPN or with Turner in some other state locale, you know, um, where the interviewer or the broadcaster would be, and they would be beamed in. And this was kind of funny, and Seth, I'll, I'll ask you to talk about this, but like, you know, they really had fun with it, which I which I love because that's all part of this, right? Is when you can have fun with um, technology and 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 make it more relatable for for fans and audiences. And so they would get beamed in where the interviewer's hologram would be face to face, basically in real life, like in real size with the actual athlete or talent that was inside of the bubble. And so it allows you to have a real eye to eye type of interaction and conversation. I mean, pretty much everything except for 
physical touch of like you couldn't do obviously like a high five because there's no physical touch to it because it's a hologram. Um, but it really allowed for us to show the the speed and power and low latency of 5G in a in a much more call it a, um, you know authentic way to to viewers. And what we ended up doing was partnering with both ESPN and Turner throughout the conference finals, um, having some really incredible talent. Um, and then um, being able to tell those stories that were integrated in broadcast into the pregame show um, before the conference final games. And so it was a really uh, exciting um, collaboration that we got to see come to life, whether that be on linear or on social channels like Bleacher, et cetera. But so Seth, tell yeah. us, what was it like being on the broadcaster side? Uh, I, I think the, I guess I'll let one premise, uh, preface I'll say is, you know, when working with Chiz's team, you know, the goal has always been, okay, we got this 5G, you know, how do we tangibly showcase what it can do and the power of it? So that's always kind of been the garden, you know, the guiding principle. Uh, and then when we first started talking about this concept, I was like, there's no way that's possible. Like, how can we do it? But when you look at AT&T's tech teams and the Warner Media tech teams and, and ESPN and, and Disney, uh, you know, when you put all those minds together collaboratively, you know, they made it happen. And it was, it was pretty amazing. And I think the, the, the core component to it for me that, um, you know, it's probably pretty simple, but in reality, we're, we're used to having face to face interviews prior to a game and we take those sound bites and we, we bring them into the telecast to key up key storylines. So for us, you know, that's something that just went away with the bubble, you know, uh, media availability was incredibly limited. Uh, and most guys, you know, didn't even participate if they didn't have to. So to be able to bring somebody face to face with an athlete and bring back the kind of normalcy of a face to face interview or one on one interview to ask some questions about the, the series itself, but also what's life like in the bubble uh, was core to us. And that was, was a huge piece that we were really happy that we could pull off. Um, you know, I, I think the technology was fun because once we tried to explain it to the talent, uh, you know, like Draymond Green is who we originally signed this up for. It was media days with Dre. Uh, and he was so geeked up about it because he didn't get invited to the bubble because the Warriors didn't make the 22 teams. But he was excited to be, you know, virtually inserted into the bubble. So he was all about it. And then, you know, Lucky for him, he came, became a father a little earlier than was expected, so he had to, to jump back to the West Coast, but we were able to bring in Kenny Smith, Stephanie Reddy, and Isaiah Thomas to interview different folks, and depending on who we got, we, we matched up the right talent with them. Uh, but all the guys had fun with it, even a, a Joker here, he, uh, at the end of it, I forget exactly what he said, because I don't think it was English, but uh, he was didn't know what he was looking at at that time. He was pretty impressed with it, but it, it was fun, uh, and I think all of our all of our teams, whether it's Bleacher Report or Turner or MBAD, I think they all got behind it and, and they saw the value in it. So we, we quickly had to think about, okay, if we're going to be able to do this on media day, you know, when does it make sense to run it? So we were able to run it in the, the following days pregame because we had a day off in between each. And then we utilized Bleacher Report and MBA uh, and TNT Social to drive awareness and, and, and attention to it. Uh, and some of the quick sound bites that we could leak out early. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a fun process. And I think our, uh, our talent was, was very impressed. And so was our production team. And certainly in a time of COVID when we have social distancing and what have you, right? Like this starts to tease the future of like what is in the possible of interviews and, and other things, right? So whether that be from a, a business or a consumer use case, et cetera, um, powered by 5G, it's certainly a, a really exciting um, way to tease out what what might happen. So yeah, I mean, that. the frequency you can get your talent to any different interview and uh, the availability that that, that that does for you. It's almost like a modern day junket where you can you can get to anywhere you need to for these interviews and, and keep them safe at home. Absolutely. So what was the end result? Um, it was what we'll call a win win. Um, the the viewership I know on linear the you know the viewership across on social we had a, we received a lot of organic love which is always a a great way to measure success for for something like this um, in a way to get an indication of of how it's resonating with with this fan base and this audience base 
Um, and uh, and so certainly it was one that was really exciting um, to see come together. It, you know, again, it starts to tease some of that, you know, future of 5G again, like, you know, as a company and as a brand, right? Like there's there is certainly that product level messaging that, that we like to be able to surface. Um, certainly from a brand perspective, I know for everybody on this call, uh, that is something that is very important as well um, for people to understand, you know, what is it that you stand for? What is it that you represent? What are those things that, um, you know, help you connect with, um, with your consumer base, et cetera. Um, and, you know, certainly, you know, I, you know, somebody were to ask, well, what's the secret sauce? I mean, certainly having, all of the different pieces, right? So, you know, Seth talked earlier about, you know, it, it's, it's the brilliant creative writers and the brilliant um, producers and, and, and all of their great ideas and the things that they know about the fandom of. And, you know, and it's certainly about understanding this fan base. And it's certainly about bringing brilliant technologists to the table who will, you know, outsmart me on 5G factoids any day. Um, but it is really about the art of and also bringing together the, the right people in the right way and then harnessing that collective energy um, in that right way that will then bring everything together because as you can imagine right this was not like a straight linear fashion of call it day-to-day -day successes to get us to the finale right as you can imagine there's like ups and downs and 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 things of that nature that that take place and um, and and certainly during a pandemic, again, we got to remind ourselves we're in the middle of a pandemic. You you know you you have to come to expect that, and you just have to stay you know nimble and, and fast on your toes to be able to roll with whatever it is that that comes your way. So um, I know when I get asked what was the secret sauce, I'd say it was the village. It was the village all the way. Yeah, I think you see the two of us, but it was it was more than a village. I mean, it was a and everybody was as passionate. Was, is tied in to make it work. I, I think it's fun when you can see the tech side of the folks really get excited about pulling something off uh, that's never been done and, and pulling it off in this environment uh, was even more of a feat. I, the only thing I keep thinking of is when we did the, the Shack uh, AT&T 5G courtside cam at All Star during Slam Dunk, like I think we had 30 just people hovering around, let alone doing all the actual work. You know, I mean, that was a, a, a ton of people and we were able to do this with essentially I think two people in the room on off, on off shifts, I think was pretty impressive. So it was definitely took a village. And I think the, the fun part for me, I know there's all kinds of metrics, but I think when the talent and the, the content team buy into it and, and see the value, I think that to me is a success metric for what my team does. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly that, right? I know we're just, we're two people on this camera screen today because we're fortunate to be here. But certainly there are, I mean, it was probably, I mean, probably a couple hundred people at some point that had touched the different pieces here to, to bring this to life. So quite humbling. Um, I know we're, we are, you know, just like we were joking about earlier about things coming fast and furious, uh, obviously in the, what was it, three or four weeks that, get, you know, notice that we were given on draft. I know we've got um, just to tease a little something to come next week around the draft. So, so look out for that for, for any um, NBA draft fans. Um, and then certainly I know everybody is, um, you know, fast and hard at work towards the, the tip off coming up December 22nd for the next NBA season. So a lot more to come in this, in this crazy 2020 year. Sure. Yeah, so I know we're about, I think we're about five minutes early. Let me try, let me stop sharing here. And then I think I saw like a Q&A window. Oh, whoa, there is a lot here. <laughs> um, why don't we take a quick look? Can, Seth, can you see them as well? Yep. The question? Okay. Let me see here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, this, I don't know, we have chat and we have Q&A. Um, a question here, if, if Turner Sports will be back at CES this year, I, I don't think this year is gonna uh, work for us. Uh, I think we're, we'll be laser focused on getting the NBA up and running and, and meeting our new safety protocols. But we definitely had a lot of fun there the, the two or three years that we were out there uh, with our live show. Uh, but, uh, 
I, there's this one question from, I think it's Isabel. Um, sorry if I'm butchering that. It's, I think it's Isabel. The success of the NBA bubble this year and the likelihood of this being conducted again, how can brands effectively engage with fans? Now, I don't work for the NBA, but here's my, I'll give you my two cents. Um, which would be obviously, I think that, you know, times like this during COVID when um, call it physical activations have been canceled and a lot of brands and companies have, um, you know, pivoted activations more to, to, to digital ones. I think the interesting thing is that certainly there are new cultural moments and new things that have emerged that perhaps we wouldn't have tried before. And I'm sure you'll probably hear about that throughout today. Um, and I think that one of the exciting things to emerge from the year is that there is you know, a lot of that is based in technology. So, you know, call it an acceleration of technology. That's no surprise, I don't think, to anyone, whether that be, um, you know, from an arena standpoint, uh, you know, arena operations, logistics, et cetera, or from a brand perspective on how you integrate your own products and services. Um, and I think that even call it in the future of the new normal, my guess is that some of that's going to stay, some of that's going to stick, and some of that's going to integrate. Um, certainly, I know the NBA is kind of, you know, they've, they've teased that a little bit, right? I think there's going to be some great learnings that come from this that will will continue. Hey, Shiz, Nick, I got a quick question for you. Um, yeah. How, how long did it take you guys internally to sell in the concept of like creating a hologram? I know you guys are always trying to be tech first and, and lead the way, but I mean, it's, it's a crazy concept. Like it's like, and how do you guys all of a sudden expedite that to be ready for the bubble? I'm trying to think of how long, I don't think, I mean, it didn't take much at all. I mean, usually, you know, concepts, uh, it honestly, it's more of the logistical, you know, the logistics and the tactical, all of that, that is what takes the longest, frankly, because we want to make sure it's going to work, obviously. But you know what, I'm, I, I would say, and, and, and Seth, I'm going to look at you a little bit as well, but I think we're pretty fortunate. We've got leadership that really understands the importance of, they obviously get it from a 5G perspective, uh, you've got to be really future first. And so sometimes you've got to take a little bit of a, you know, you take a little bit of a leap. Um, I know I, I certainly, my, my team hates it when I say this, but I always tell them this is that I don't ever want to have to push you towards the ledge with something or an idea. I want to pull you back from it. Um, and even if we're in the middle of a pandemic, that doesn't change, right? You got to, we still got to go deliver and this is how we're going to go do it. So. I would say from a um, sell-in perspective to leadership, I think getting it absolutely right, right? That's that partnership with a broadcaster, et cetera, and getting that storyline correct. I think that's the part that took the most finessing and careful integration. Yeah, I think when the two tech teams brought the idea together, you know, we had instant buy-in. As long as they said they could do what they thought they could do, uh, you know, it was pretty quick. I mean, I think we were talking in, you know, in mid early August, and we had to have it set up in early September, and it was no problem. And everybody was excited about the idea. Uh, and I think quickly we're the, the, the idea if we could do it. Well, I guess I guess maybe maybe the last question for you guys, and this is maybe just from all of us working at big brands, is understanding how do you not screw it up? And what I mean is, is like it's it's gone great. Everybody sees the successes, and you guys will make tweaks. How do you not overdo it? Like, I'm sure you get millions of requests for everything from corporate, you know, uses to other partners that you guys have, have deals with. So, like, shit, you guys have a deal with uh, the masters. How are you not, like, having that team not beat down your door to be like, oh, we got to be doing it here. We have to be in every How do you keep it, like, a slow, methodical growth and not just, you know, rush it too fast? I think it's just careful. I mean, the best you can, I, it's hard to say careful planning in 2020 because it is so difficult, but I think it comes down to, it has to be authentic and right for that fan base. I think number two, it's about what you have access to. Obviously what we get access to what's going on right now over at Augusta National is a little bit different than what happens um, within the NBA bubble. So we just, you know, we, we uh, pivot accordingly to that. And then I think number three is, um, you know, it's, it's, not about saying no, but it's about finding the right opportunity. So I think that becomes that finessing of when you sit at the hub of the wheel is a little bit of, um, you know, if there's a better opportunity, then you want to surface that and provide that for that right part, right product message, the right brand message, the right corporate message, and then also for that particular partner and sponsorship as well. So it's definitely a lot of finessing. Well. Again, Seth, Shiz, appreciate you guys' time. Obviously, congratulations on the amazing technology this year. And 
look forward to hearing more from you guys in the, in the next couple of months and good luck on the draft. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us.